I used to be, if you're familiar with my story or not, extremely shy, extremely awkward. Um, I was this little kid from Switzerland, by the way. I grew up in a small town of 650 people, a little cow town in the country in Switzerland. That was my upbringing, and my existence up until 2006 was very miserable. I was extremely shy. I had almost no friends. It was a very lonely existence. I couldn't speak up. I would even have social anxiety around family members, which is insane. Like even going down for dinner was scary. It's like, oh, I'm gonna have to speak up at the table. Or even worse was a family gathering, like the holidays. That would, I would have so much anxiety around the holidays. It was terrible. Um, and of course, when you're quiet, what do people do? Well, we'll speak up, what's up with you? We'll share some news, what's up, Julian? Nothing, just kill me. Like that, that was my reality, for real. Um, I was really awkward. I had one outlet, fortunately, though, which was music. I played guitar from the age of eight, played with a friend in a band from the age of 12. We composed. I would even play at like high school shows and stuff. And when I would go on stage, that was the one avenue, only doing music. I, no way would I talk or anything else. But just music, playing guitar, was my one way of self-expression. And life honestly felt like hell. It felt like a prison. It was terrible. And I'd see people acting completely unstifled, people smiling, people having a blast, socializing. I'm like, why not me? Just living in this ball of anxiety. And again, it's like, well, at least there's music. So in 2006, I found out about self-help. I found out you could change something. And I took action. And I went from that, this shy little awkward kid in a farm town in Switzerland, to traveling around the world, having amazing friendships, amazing relationships, to forming a family. I have kids now too to ultimately living my dream life, doing something I love, doing something I'm passionate about, and more importantly, being free from that invisible prison. And you can sense where the walls are. This is important for all of you. You think you have free will, not necessarily. You have a certain amount, as long as it's within that invisible prison, also known in the mainstream as your comfort zone. You wanna know where the walls of the prison are? Go see where you get triggered. For example, when it comes to socializing, around who do you start feeling stifled? That's the wall. There are some people where you're like, hey, you know what? I feel comfortable around this person. Oh, I'm a little cool. This person's gonna like me. And you're yourself. I'm sure you have friends like that. Then you talk to someone you might be believe is, mm, they're a little bit outside my league. Oh! And you freeze. Whoa, you just hit a wall of that prison. I thought you had free will. <laughs> I thought you could be confident no matter what. Nope, you hit a wall. Self-sabotage, too, will let you know where those walls are. If you audit your life, what amount of financial success do you allow yourself to get? If you audit the past five years, what's the amount that's been in your bank account on average? Health-wise, where have you resided on average? Every time you hit that wall, self-sabotage kicks in, and you go back into that invisible prison. That's the sad reality of most people, and they just bounce around this prison trying to feel better about not changing which is also why dream sexuality is so appealing. Okay, so this here is what got me out of that prison. It's not some quick tips. None of you here will be changed permanently at the end of this speech, but you will know the direction. If any of you think you can just permanently change like that, you are delusional. You are. That is mainstream magic pill self-help promotion. You can just change like that, one little tip. I'll even see this sometimes in comments under videos. Someone's like, you just gotta be yourself. I'm like, really? really? If something that simple actually worked, everyone would be crushing it. Hey, you just gotta relax and go with the flow. No shit. <laughs> really, just relax and go with the flow? Like, little things like that, although true, don't produce change. You gotta put in the work, put in the reps, and you gotta give it time. Okay, so that's my goal here, is at the end, you have a new understanding. You also see how a lot of the mainstream paths promoted are completely wrong, and you know exactly what to do, and then it's up to you if you want to put the work in or not. I'm not saying this for all of you here. I'm saying this for the few action takers here who are like, you know what, enough with the dream sexuality, let's get to work. And for those of you who are like, enough with this current situation, let's get to work. And there should be some frustration, some anger, some fear, and even some pain around your current comfort zone. Misery tends to be the first teacher. You don't want it to be the last, but it does tend to be the first. Where you look around and you're like, 
Enough's enough. If you look at your life, who you are, and you're like, eh, it's not that bad, nothing's really going to change. It's so easy then to just rationalize, well, why would I go through hell and back if this is not that bad? This shore better be terrible, better be on fire, and you better be swimming for a better one. If you don't realize it's on fire, then that's another key shift. Start taking note of all the things that you don't like about who you are currently and your current life situation. Make that list. And don't try to downplay it. Take the hit. Now, when I say this, one final note, there's always someone who's like, I never had that actual moment where it was enough is enough. My life was always pretty average. And that's the silent, sneaky killer of progress. Then you better audit your entire life and be like, wait a minute. I'm choosing this moment now for it to be that enough's enough moment. If you haven't had it, don't wait for it to happen. Make it happen. When? Now. now. <laughs> that too, by the way. When does transformation happen? Now. 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 Like, no joke. If you catch your vocabulary and you're someone who says, I should, I need to, those are the words of procrastinators and slackers. Oh, I need to. What does it imply? Someday, not now. Whenever I hear someone say that, even on my team, one, I eradicate that. I'm like, I never want to hear I need to. I should. Never want to hear that. And whenever someone still lets it slip up, I say, when exactly? Oh, I need to. Okay, when? How? Let's go. Let, let's come up with a plan. Oh, no, no. Well, we should at some point. When's this some point? That lets you off the hook. Oh, Julian's right. You know, I really should, um, you know, sit down and take the hit and be motivated. Okay, when? When exactly? Eliminate that from your vocabulary. No shoulds, no I need to, no at some point, no someday, someday too. That is no longer acceptable in the self-help world. You know, a PC is taken over, that's not PC. Oh, that's not self-help PC. No more somedays. There are eight levels of transformation. All of you reside somewhere on this scale. Any sticking point, obstacle, issue in your life, any problem that you're dealing with can be linked to one of these levels. There's not a single problem in your life that you cannot link to one of these levels. So I highly suggest writing them down. The bottom, there's apathy. Then there's grief. And forgive my handwriting. Then there's fear. And there's anger. Courage. Desire, purpose, love. These are the levels of transformation. This is how it happens. Down here, you could think of these as the competitive states. Up here is the collaborative states. So. We're gonna break this down here, but the first thing I wanna point out is that most people don't have a clear system. Audit this within yourself. If you're winging self-help, winging success, and there's no clear map, you're screwed. And this is something that got amplified with social media. Meaning when I first started working on myself, there were some courses out there, they weren't as good as they are now, they weren't that great, but compared to what else was out there, they were life-changing. But if you wanted to get good, you'd find a course, you'd get a system, and you'd apply it. There wasn't all this content out there for free. Now, free content is amazing. Social media, if you use it and you don't get used by it, is amazing as well. I put tons of content out for free. I think it's very helpful. However, there's also downsides if you don't know how it works. First downside is everything's disorganized. And people then try to take little bits and pieces from little content here, this little content there, and then you try to organize it yourself. And because you aren't an expert, you're learning, people tend to organize it the wrong way. And they come up with a flawed system and they're screwed. Or they don't even try to organize it and that's even worse. You can't. You gotta find a clear system that's your compass, that's your map that you keep coming back to. This is mine. Don't just wing it. Some other downsides, by the way, with social media free content is the content that's put out there isn't 
meant to necessarily help you. It's meant to get views. It's the same as the news. The incentive isn't to report on facts, it's to get clicks, right? So instead of, and this shifted recently, way, way back in the day when YouTube first started, uh, you know, or even general social media, the algorithms were very different. But now, a helpful piece of advice or content, which by the way, helpful isn't necessarily catchy, doesn't get as many clicks as something catchy. So it incentivizes people, coaches, teachers, to only put content out that will get clicks. And the content that get clicks isn't the content that necessarily helps you. Okay, um, I think there's a, it was called uh, The Social Dilemma. It's a documentary on Netflix. Um, it's very basic. Uh, if you don't, if you watch it and you're blown away, then you are behind. You should know everything that's in there. But I'd suggest watching it. But the one thing it fails to address, so it talks about how social media affects us. The one thing it fails to address is how it also affects the creators, the content creators, which is what I just talked about. You're now incentivized to just put that out. You're also incentivized to back up certain ideas that might not be accurate. For example, let's just say there's a trend that says um, eating an apple is the key to success. Eating an apple will make you millions. Let's just say that is a trend for some reason. Someone puts a video out, the solution to your problems is you just got to eat a goddamn apple. And there's a video of them eating an apple. Say that gets a million views or so. What are other content creators going to do? Well, that one got a lot of clicks. I bet if I make my own video eating an apple, that'll get some clicks too. So you do the apple eating video, and someone else does an apple video. And pretty much now there's all this social proof and authority behind this idea of eating an apple equals success. So for a newcomer coming in, you're like, whoa, what's this apple technique I heard about? And you think it's accurate because it's backed up by a ton of content. So this is also how the algorithm will push very stupid, dumb, and even sometimes destructive ideas to the forefront. So beware. And then a third thing with social media is that in order to get clicks, your RAS, your selective focus, is either tuning into value or threats. And what you'll notice is that something that talks about and harps on a problem tends to be more captivating than a solution. So you're going to have all these videos that talk about problems, but that don't necessarily give you the solution, because it gets more views. So if you want to get real results, use social media. I love it. I love it to educate myself on some general things. But once I found something I really like, I try to find content off platform. Whether it's in a course, whether it's in person, whether it's on Zoom or a coaching, that's where I try to go. I don't want the algorithm getting in the way. I want the incentive to be, give me the result, versus maybe the result, but mainly clicks. No, 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 I want the clicks out of it, okay? So for you, keep that in mind, and most importantly, have a clear system. Now, this year, this is the process of transformation. I'll quickly take you through them. Apathy, as we said, competitive. So competitive is you versus. It's a lot of playing not to lose. Apathy is you versus the world. You versus people, and it's the lowest state. It's a state where you just lost all hope and you just give up, right? Internally, feeling-wise, apathy is resistance to feeling. It's giving up on feeling. Ultimately, it's even giving up on life. Um, when it comes to different goals, it's goals where you won't even think about them because you're like, well, what's the point? I'll never make it anyway. None of you here are in apathy or you wouldn't be in this event, right? Someone who's in apathy won't even look up content to change because what's the point? I can't change. Why would I look up content, right? Um, you might have a pocket of apathy though, and this is also very subtle. Everyone here has a main state where you find yourself in the most, but then you have also different pockets. So someone could actually let's just say, be in purpose when it comes to their job, but then be in apathy when it comes to their relationships. Oh, it's the point. But the job-wise, everything's aligned and great. Or they might be in desire when it comes to relationships, and then in grief, this is the level of victimhood when it comes to their health, so on and so forth. So that's apathy, it's the what's, what's the point? And this does tend to come 
usually after a lot of hope and despair. You try it, you fail. You try it, you fail. You try it, you fail. And at some point you're like, well, why even try? Right? Even with feeling. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm sad. You know what? I'm just not going to feel happy. At least I won't feel sad. I'm just not going to feel. That's apathy. As you move up, you hit grief. And that is where you feel like a victim. Where you could, unlike apathy where you can't, here I could, but, and you list out the excuses. Now, this brings something very interesting in terms of this process, where with each level as you move up, you gain access to more energy and more power. And advice changes per level. So when you hear, as an example, you're a victim. Do you think that is good advice, yes or no? Telling someone they're a victim. Yes. Depends. For most people, no. However, for someone who's in apathy, who's lost hope, telling them they are a victim is actually empowering. Because they're in the state where they're like, I just can't anyway. And you telling them, wait, 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 that's not true. You actually could, but it's the government, it's the president, it's the economy, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's your past, it's that. Oh, that's why. So it's not ideal, but you actually move up. You gain a little bit more life force, you could say, more energy, more power. However, you don't want to reside here. From here, you move up to fear. And this is where you hear classic advice like, take responsibility, claim your power back, don't be a victim. It's very disempowering. Step it up. Oh, but that's scary to take responsibility. Good, you're now in fear. Or, even moving up higher to anger, get pissed at yourself. Enough! Don't be a little pussy-ass bitch! Like, stuff like that like, resonates a lot. That's a, this is a lot of self-help, by the way, on, even on social media. Why is that pumped so much? Because this is where most people reside, between grief and anger. <clears throat> grief is, oh, it's too hard. No, no, no. Oh, it's scary. And then you might be like, don't be a pussy. And you step it up to anger, and then you fall off, and you go back to grief, and you just kind of rotate between this. Even in the news, what do you see? Victimhood, fear, outrage. <laughs> That's where most people are at. That's also why messages like, step it up, aren't you sick of it? Enough, don't be a pussy, come on. Everyone's like, yeah, because you move up to anger. With every level you move up, it feels like oh, you feel this little high. So here it's instead of feeling sorry for yourself, get pissed at yourself. Do you want to reside there though? No. So notice how advice changes for each level. And all of these are you versus. Me versus, what's the point? Me versus, oh, I'm a victim. Me versus, oh, it's scary. Me versus, let's do something about it. I'll show them. Okay, playing not to lose. Then, as you let go of this, you move up to the collaborative. Courage is the first level where you actually start playing to win. It's not you versus. It's not you running away from trying to avoid. It's, hey, what's my win? A key question you should all ask yourself. What is your win in life? What's your goal? Where are you moving towards? Most people have no idea. They know what they don't want, but they have no idea what they want. And I'm not saying win in terms of some vague future someday idea. I mean precisely. Where are you going precisely? Five years from now, what does that look like? What do you look like? What are you doing? What's your life situation? What's your job situation? What's your friendship situation? What's your relationship situation? You should be very clear on that. This is courage. However, with courage, this is where you tend to have a general idea, still a little vague, and you take a little step in that direction and you tell yourself that's good enough. It's the land of small wins, it's the land of dabbling, and it can even be the land of procrastination. Little win, little win, little win, little win. Then there's desire. And this is actually where you can think of this as like you're running away from the stick, right? Desires the little carrot. And I put it here because you can actually temporarily use this to stick to something for a longer period of time. Hey, if you paint that beautiful, happy ending, you can actually stick at the task longer than just the little win because the carrot's dangling. But I also put it above courage because this is also where your ego will come in the back door and take a win that is authentic, but then steer it towards I'll be happy win. 
So this is something you want to let go of as well. When you let go of desire, let go of the carrot, you then tap into purpose. You shift from acting out of desperation to acting out of inspiration. And then you move up to love. This is the whole process. As I mentioned, you all find yourself somewhere here and you also have pockets. Any sticking point linked to one of these levels. You can always bring it back to it. Oh, I'm experiencing social anxiety. Could be fear. I'm self-sabotaging. Well, it could also be grief. You're trying to stay low. Oh, I'm making things harder than they need be. It could be anger. It could be desire, neediness. All of it comes back to this scale. Now, there's three reasons, understanding this, why people fail. One, they don't understand the path. Like I said, you're just kind of winging it. Or, say you're in grief, you start going up into fear and anger, and you might say, wait a minute, fear and anger is not good. I'm going the wrong way, and you go back. No, no, no. And that's why I keep saying, progress, success is not linear. So now you know the path. Two, they don't know where they're at. And if you don't know where you're at, you won't know what type of advice to apply. Big mistake people make. They're in fear, they think they're in courage. And they're applying advice and courage when they should be applying fear advice. Or vice versa. This is also, once you really understand this and all these levels, because there's so many subtleties to each one, it's also what allows you to now filter out the infinite free content that's on social media. Whenever I see a piece of content on social media, I always ask myself, what level does this go to? Who is this for? You better know. And they'll also help you filter out once you know where you're at, what is useful to you and what isn't. So that's the other big mistake. And the third is people try to skip ahead. They try to jump too high. Say you're in fear, you wanna jump up to purpose, way too high of a jump. Aim for one, maybe two, and work your way up. But this is the path, this is the system. There are three components to success. I call this SAS. One is system, which we talked about, having a clear system. What are the other two? Accountability, which we also talked about. And last one is support. SAS. System, accountability, support. That is the secret magic cocktail, if you will, for success. Whenever you're working on yourself, or whenever you even think of, say, joining a program or a coaching, you better audit and make sure that there is SAS. Any course where you might have fallen off, slacked off on, didn't complete, it's because there wasn't SAS. Now most programs that you'll find will have a system. That's most courses. If you go online, any digital course, you're gonna see a system. This is what you get. There's module one, module two, blah, 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 blah. There's a whole system, okay, great. But then you're left with that. And I've seen it over the years where people will buy a course, you're all excited at first, you start watching through the videos, and then that's it, you're left with the system. You're still not taking action, you still have the same excuses, you just know more about it. That's not enough. A system will lead to you knowing more about your problems, but not solving your problems. You gotta differentiate between the two. Are you learning about your problems or solving them? You'll see a lot of people who've been in the self-help world a while, they know everything about their problems. Everything, more than they should. Yet they still have those same problems. Like, well here's my problem, and it came from my childhood, and this is, have you solved it? No, I've just learned about it. Not good. So system isn't enough. Next one is accountability. A system and accountability. So there has to be some process that holds you accountable to take action on that system. People and money equals accountability. And this is where you must audit where you're at in your journey and what you can use to your advantage. If you're someone who has no money, people. That's what I did, like I talked about. Surround yourself with people. And ask me people once more who hold you accountable where you also care about their opinion and you don't want to look like an idiot in front of them. If it's just you and yourself, you will slack off and slack off and slack off until you've done the work. So involve people. Then involve money. That creates a ton 
of accountability, skin in the game, and lights that fire under your ass. A tip for procrastination you might have heard me talk about is whatever it is you're procrastinating on, just give a 500 bucks to your friend. Even a thousand, give a thousand bucks to your friend. And tell your friend, if I don't do that thing by X day or time, you keep the thousand. You're not gonna procrastinate, no matter what it is, right? Because there's accountability. You put yourself in a situation where success is inevitable, no matter what it is. People would even do this back in the day. I only did it a couple times, mainly because I was super broke starting out. But uh, you'd go out, say, with a friend and say you wanted to work on your social skills. You give 100 bucks to your friend, and you're like, every time I say hi to someone, I get 10 bucks back. Now you're going to say hi to someone. Accountability is what eliminates procrastination and excuses. You only have procrastination and excuses when you have the luxury of not having the accountability, the luxury of getting away with it. And this is where you must also learn about yourself and say, okay, at what point does it light that fire? Meaning around what type of people and how much money-wise. This is one that people who have already accomplished a good amount of financial success actually can have trouble with because what they pay for certain, say, courses or coaching simply isn't enough to light that fire under their ass. It's actually a huge problem. And for those of you who have accomplished a certain amount, you know what I'm talking about, where you're like, ugh, what's a few thousand? It's like a penny, and you're not motivated. So you need to know how to coach yourself and what will poke your buttons and trigger you and scare you the most. The more you're scared and resist doing it, the more you guarantee that when you do, the fire will be strong and you will take action. So system and accountability, but that's not enough. And accountability too, even on a coaching side, that's a little bit more of the um, step it up side of things. Step it up, take action, come on. But it's also kind of, it's the kind of harsh approach and not everyone necessarily resonates with that. So just that isn't enough and that's where you need also support. Support is the more nurturing advice where instead of step it up, it's, hey, you got this. I believe in you. How can I help? I'm here to support. And that energy there is also very, very empowering. Having people who actually believe in you. For most of us in our lives, very few believe in us. Sometimes even zero. <laughs> Maybe you don't even believe in yourself. It's like, no one including me. This is a cheesy quote, but it's a very true and powerful one. Sometimes all it takes is just one person who believes in you. So true. And I'll see this even in my coaching. I have a Facebook group that goes with it. There'll be comments below. Someone's like, you got this. A stranger just saying you got this. And someone will read that and feel so empowered and motivated to take action. They're like, wow, if someone else can see it within me, maybe it's there. Maybe I do have what it takes. Someone's actually betting and looking forward and believing in my own success. Because what do most people around you say? Oh, don't dream too big. That's dumb. Play it safe. Just stay where you're at. And it's like, whoa. Get the opposite and see what happens. But then even a system alone and just support, because you'll see that too with no accountability. It's like, here's the system. I believe in all of you. You got, it's too meh, meek. So you need the nice balance of the three. Make a cocktail out of sass and you will crush it. <laughs> you'll get sassy. You'll get real sassy and crush it, okay? Um, but this is key, so whenever, you do, enter it and make sure there is SAS. Is there a system? Yes, check. Is there accountability? Yes, check. Is there support? Yes, check. This, although it's very simple, took me years to figure out. Years. Why? Because there's what works, or what you think works in the short term, as we talked about, and there's what works in the long term. This is what works in the long term. This is what gets not just someone who's already super motivated to take action, but anyone to start taking action as long as the willingness is there at a core. And then this here is how I then started shifting all of my coaching. If you want a little bit of behind the scenes in terms of how I created my coaching, I have this program called The Mentoring, Transformation Mastery Mentoring. It's built on SaaS. Where for the longest time, I've had many programs. I've had live event programs, digital programs, and they're all great. But the pinnacle, what it all led to, is this. 
where it's not just the system, and this is how I structured it, by the way. This is, um, I launched it three years ago, almost three years ago. It was November 2019 is when I first started the mentoring. And since then, over 700 people have gone through it. And with every person who's gone through it, I've refined it till I've tweaked like a little mad scientist and perfected the whole system. And this is how it's designed now, just so you also understand psychology and how to coach yourself. When you enter, so to list it out, it's eight weeks, okay? It's an eight week program where every week, what do you go through? The different levels from apathy to love. So you have the system broken down. So every week you'll get content that breaks down all the subtleties because there's so many nuances, people misinterpret, they confuse some. So you'll understand all the system, the different steps you have to take. You'll understand ultimately the path that you will have to walk on your own. The very triggering path that you will have to walk on your own. But it doesn't stop there, as we said, or then it'll just gather dust. You're like, oh, I know the path. Did you walk it? No, but I know it. Terrible. So then it encompasses accountability. So under levels, you get content. You get mindset shifts, right, or mindsets. But then you get accountability in the form of missions that you have to report back on in two ways. One, in a Facebook group, and two, on live Zoom calls. And this here also serves as support. So let me break it down, and I hope it clicks, assuming you understand all this. Eight weeks, every week you get content, so you understand the system. Every week you also get missions that are linked to this content, where you have to take action on it, and based upon those missions, it's going to trigger what you bury deep down inside, what you don't know you don't know. That's then going to come up to the surface. Now to make sure you take action on these missions, there has to be the accountability that comes from, on one hand, a Facebook group, this is a private group that my clients are in, and every single mission that they have to execute on, there's some kind of report that they have to make in the group where there's some kind of proof, the only way you can post a report is by doing it. So there's the proof aspect that you must take action on it. This hits on accountability where then I can track it. And I do, my coaches and I literally have an Excel file tracking the progress of every single client and we'll see where they fall off or they don't. So on your end, there's the accountability of the price for it, so the money on, like that lights that fire under your ass, but then there's the accountability of, you don't wanna disappoint me and the coaches and get kicked out. You better take action. <gasps> now you're in that situation where you have to take action and we will know because of the reports whether you did or didn't take action. So you have to report back and then based upon what you report back, this is the true gold. Now that you say take action on a mission, you get triggered, right? One of the formulas that I'll teach you in this is action, trigger, release, repeat. Action, trigger, release, repeat. You take action, you get triggered, you let go and you repeat. Now that you get triggered, you can report back on it, and then on the Zoom calls, and there's two a week, so 24 seven in Facebook group, two a week, direct access to me, we can then talk about what got triggered inside. It could be a feeling, maybe a memory, maybe a person, maybe a certain situation, maybe it made you think of this. Then we talk about it, and then this here is what allows us to get to the gold in terms of what is running you and how to let go of it. And then this is the cool thing with the content, you also get letting go meditations for each level. These are the meditations that I personally use. Only eight, the ones in this course. That's how I live my life. That's my tool belt for life, by the way. Anything that happens to in life, right? Famous saying, life's gonna keep lifing. Tons of stuff's gonna be thrown at you. You're gonna have ups and downs in life, so am I. Some of us are equipped, some of us aren't. Once you understand the scale and you have the releases and the mindsets, you're invincible. That gives you that true sense of safety and security where something could happen, boom, you're in a pocket of fear. People then freak out, oh, fear. I'm like, oh, fear, interesting, that's the theme. Let me pull out the mindsets and the meditation, done. Oh, I'm in desire, 
Mindsets, meditations, done. Ooh, I'm not really sure what I should do in my life now. Purpose, mindsets, meditation, done. It's easy. It's so easy. So, and these are the exact ones I do. There's no secret meditations. It's all here. But now that you take action, then we can talk about it on Zoom. We dissect that data. Then you take more action, and there's, you follow the whole process of going from apathy all the way to love. And the data moves you up, and moves you up, and moves you up, and moves you up, to the point where at the end, you made a ton of change, you understand the whole system, you're equipped, you know how it works, and you're fucking set. And then, of course, there's the support here, too, where you're not doing it alone, there's a group, you'll see other people take action. You'll also learn one of the most important things to realize is that what is most personal is most universal a famous self-help saying, what's most personal is most universal, and you realize it's not just you. This is one of the unfair advantages that I have as a coach. I get to see the behind the scenes of most people. You don't. You see the fake little fronts that people put up and hide behind, and then you compare everything that you know about yourself to those little fronts, which aren't reality. As a coach, I get to see behind the fronts. I get to see the real issues. I get to see how people truly operate, what's truly running them. And I get to see how similar we all are and how similar all of our issues actually are. And that is very empowering. Even just feeling part of a larger, just, just this sense of unity, this larger part like of a community. It's like, it's not just me. I always felt like it was just me. Something was off with me and everyone has it so much better. That's not true. People just hide it, just as you probably hide it. And you'll see, knowing that you're not alone in this, incredibly inspiring and empowering. Okay? And this here is the design, the structure that makes it so failure is impossible. One of the most common things I hear at the end is people are like, you know what? This is the first course I actually finished all the way till the end. Why? Simple. SAS. You create the right amount of SAS, all of you will take action. And you can apply this same mentality outside of this to any goal you have, by the way. You're slacking off on something, did you create SAS? Do you know the steps to get there? Is there accountability support? Nope. Start with that, instead of hoping that someday things will change. Make it change. And have that sense of urgency. Make it change now, don't wait. No shoulds, no I need to. Now, now, now. And then, Really putting this all together, when you start letting go and ultimately reowning everything that is you, this is how you raise your level of self-esteem, by the way. It's also how you cultivate what I call core confidence, not situational. Situational going back to I don't feel good enough is the whole I'll only feel good enough if. It's based on external things. Screw that. You want the type of core confidence where you're confident? Why? Just because. That's what it leads to. And the more your level of self-esteem rises, the more you let success land. The less self-sabotage there is. The more those invisible prison walls dissipate and fade away. And things get peachy, and you start enjoying the process, enjoying the results. Another key saying, if you're not enjoying the results you're getting, those are not results. Sadly, most people keep chasing phantoms. And ultimately, as cheesy as it sounds, by raising your vibe, you raise the vibe of the world. And that even for me personally, like why is it that I teach this? Why is that I'm so passionate about this? One, because it changed my life completely, night and day. But two, kind of zooming out and seeing the direction of the world, especially now, like I have kids, I don't like the direction things are going. When you start getting into this work and you recognize it within yourself, you start seeing it in others too. And there are far too many people who are deeply traumatized and it's leading to more and more toxicity and it is not good. And the crazy thing is no one is talking about this. It's crazy that people still think that they can be immune to trauma. You can't, it's part of being human. Every single person experiences trauma. And by the way, trauma, the, the way that we go about it, right, where if you experience something traumatic, you'll either suppress or repress, okay? The whole act of suppression, repression is actually great. That's how you handle it. If you experience something that is so overwhelming, it's good that you just dissociate. That's how you survive that. The problem isn't the suppression or repression. The problem is once that event is done or that threat is gone, we never reown what we suppressed or repressed. 
This is actually something Peter Levine talks about in the book Waking the Tiger, amazing book. He'll take a bit less of a spiritual approach to say trauma healing and letting go and works a lot with say PTSD and talks about how animals experience trauma. And an example that really stands out, and it's crazy how we all do this, is he says, okay, let's just say you take a, a deer. A deer is attacked by a bear, okay? Cornered. So the deer's there in the corner, the bear's coming at it, and you hear always fight or flight, right? Well, I'm either gonna fight when I'm in that situation, or I'm gonna run away, flight. But when you cannot do so, the deer can't fight, the deer can't run away, it's cornered, what you go into is freeze. Suppression, repression. And what you'll see animals do is they'll go into this state where they play dead and completely dissociate from the experience and from themselves. Two reasons. One, it might convince the bear that, eh, it's dead, move on. I mean, what else are you gonna do? The bear's coming, nothing you can do. Just go to your happy place. <laughs> is it gone? That's all you can really do. Um, so maybe it'll leave, but if it doesn't, and it actually tears you up and eats you up, you won't experience the pain because you're completely disconnected. So if you're someone who also has the fear of, oh man, that would hurt being ripped apart by a bear, it'll be so traumatizing, you probably won't even register. It won't even register consciously, the pain. So the deer will go in that state where it looks dead, but internally, whew, shit's hitting the fan. Say the bear walks away, doesn't rip it to shred. What you'll see is the deer will then get up and then start shaking uncontrollably, discharging all that pent up energy and then going about its jolly day. Right? Um, you'll also see, funny enough, dogs do this, right? Uh, I have a dog and she used to be like really scared at night of like trees, right? So there's something that's not actually a real threat, but she'll get scared. And you'll see her like tense up, and then as soon as we're gone, she'll be like, and then back to normal. The problem with humans, with us, is that we also experience that. Not necessarily with a bear, but with various situations, too overwhelming, where we'll either suppress the experience or, again, disown different aspects of ourselves in order to survive. So we'll go through the same thing. But once the event is done, because no one talks about this or teaches us this, unlike an animal who will shake it off, we never shake it off. So we're that deer that gets up, like, and then we're like, I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm living through life fine. Something else happens. <gasps> I'm even more fine. Something else. <laughs> I'm fine. You need to discharge. That is what's messing you up. Discharge. And if you don't, this is where you can get really out there. And there's many theories behind this, but you might find that you will attract similar situations in your life. And I also see how this can be taken out of context. Again, who knows? This is a thought experiment. You might attract similar situations, and one of the theories behind it, if it happens, is that perhaps unconsciously, a part of you is trying to help you let go of it, and it thinks that the way it will help you let go of it is by getting you to experience it again. <laughs> and then people are like, no, and, it, and it'll keep happening until you eventually do. Now don't wait for that. Take control when, now, and let go of it. And what you'll see once more is not only will that change that experience of you at a core, all that tension just, and there's a reason people talk, you know, including myself, letting go, follow this sense of relief, or this sense of feeling at home within yourself. That is letting go. It's like you can just sink into you and just, be you versus I need to be. I need like this force. I need to run away from me. I need more, better, different. Feel this, think this, get this versus let that go. What's the relationship like that you have with yourself? Can you relax into yourself? If not, letting go needs to happen. And when you can and you become someone who actually loves themselves with high self esteem, inside out game, suddenly you step into a whole experience of yourself, whole experience of the world suddenly your perception of the world changes too. Because that too, the scale from apathy to love will color what you see. Some of you here might be sitting in a state of fear and your interpretation of this whole event is scary, scary, threats, 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 threats. How do I look? Are people staring at me? Oh, cameras, oh, what, what? 
Someone might be in a state of anger. Be like, the AC is a little loud. It's a little cold. It's not talking loud. What's this anger? He's picking on the anger. Someone could be in in grief. I can't. What Julian says makes sense for others, but not little me. Little victim me. And that's all you see. It colors your focus. This is also why, by the way, it's inside out. Funny story. There was a client I had in Amsterdam. It was actually way back in the day on one of those, on that first program I did by myself uh, in Europe. And I was really scared and there was this client and he wanted to work on his confidence and social skills. And we went out and talked to a bunch of people and uh, everyone was loving this guy, loving him, smile, loving him. And then uh, we, we, we hang out after, I'm like, okay, well, that was pretty fun, right? You enjoy that? And he's like, Julian, that sucked. That was the worst time I've had in my life. I was like, what? I'm like, why? He's like, everyone hated me. No one liked me. I'm like, what? But you can clearly see how his internal state, his level of self-esteem, how he viewed himself, hijacked his focus and would block out or even distort events to keep it in line with his view of reality and in himself. He wouldn't let that land. And we actually went out the next day and I even took like some pictures and I showed him after. I'm like, how was that? He's like, terrible again. I'm like, well, what about these smiles here? And he was like, (laughs) Photoshop, (laughs) right? Um, but crazy how that happens, right? You can even sense yourself um, with a compliment, right? People, this is scary once you get this when it comes to self-sabotage. You might be aware of some of the self-sabotage you're doing, but most of it you aren't even aware of. Take a compliment, three people. Low self-esteem, hey, I like your shoes. Someone with low self-esteem is gonna be like, why, why was that person making fun of my shoes? That was a sarcastic remark, wasn't it? They just can't let it land. They distort a compliment into an insult. Someone at a mid-level, they might see the compliment. Nice shoes. And they might be like, oh, these, they're, they're nothing. And they'll try to downplay it. Some would hide it self-esteem. Hey, nice shoes. Thank you. They'll let it land. That's just a compliment. Think of opportunities in your life. How many opportunities are around you right now, but you simply have blind spots to them? Or just like someone with a compliment who will turn a compliment into an insult, you're someone who turns an opportunity into a wall. And this is also something I hear at the end is, not only have I gone through this, and it's one of the first programs I finished till the end, but I'm noticing all these opportunities around me I didn't know were there before. And they were always there. Why wouldn't I see them? Ugh. And I'm sure some of you had that experience before. Things that were there this entire time, you're like, but why didn't I see it? Blind spots. The internal colors the external. So even if you think you'll get some little references out there that'll boost your confidence, Your RAS will distort them to keep you where you're at. Or maybe to boost you a little bit, but not in a threatening way to your comfort zone or who you think you are. When you let go, everything changes. And this is the real work. And you'll see it in others. It actually adds a whole other layer of social intelligence. You hear social intelligence, look at how someone's feeling and thinking. Work on yourself, understand triggeredness, understand trauma, you'll see it in others, you'll read it in others, you'll recognize their patterns, you'll see what triggers them, you'll see where they're at in the scale, you'll be able to even predict what they'll resonate with and what they will do. And that is a superpower in and of itself. So much chaos in our lives, and I've seen this, again, teaching this for years now, so many chaos I've seen in people's lives could have easily been avoided if they had done the work and seen this and they could see the little subtleties, they could predict it, and they, one, wouldn't resonate with it, but they could get out of that situation fast. So this is the superpowers. This here, for me even as a coach, I've always tried to chase what produces the most results. In terms of my experience, which I said, 2006 working on myself, 2010 coaching, been around the ringer personally, I'm not someone who just talks about this, I walk the talk, I've coached it, I see how it affects others, so it's not just me talking from my subjective experience. I've tried and tested almost everything. My teachings have evolved, have changed. The only reason I would drop something is if I found something that is more result producing. And as of right now, this, what I broke down for you, in terms of the system itself, the approach itself, the mindsets, and zooming out more meta, the SaaS, is the most effective way when it comes to personal transformation.